I'm Josh Bottom, uh, helped uh, to organize this event. Um, I'd say about 30 years ago, I showed up in Southern California with everything I owned in the back of the car and got my first job as a, as a coder. And the folks in Southern California have always been very welcoming to me. And I can tell you, uh, over the last couple of years, I've been going around talking to people about machine learning um, projects. And I, I go around the country, around the world to talk to folks. Some of the most interesting, mo most innovative type things are happening right here in the LA Basin. And the other piece that I would say is that the people are very open, right? Uh, when we first started this, uh, I work on the Kubeflow community. Uh, we reported back to them that I was seeing a lot of interest in LA. And I said, hey, you know, I would like to bring uh, the community down to, to LA to do this so we could grow it and, and try to make things better. And so I talked to Constantinos here, and he said, yeah, let's do it. And then we got to tell you, everybody that is in the Kubeflow community today on the community calls, if, if you could stand up just so people can see who you are that are participants in the community. So these are all folks that volunteer their time to build this project. What's, you know, I always think about why do people spend their extra time, right? And if you took how many people signed up for this, it was about 300 people, 350 people. If you think about what those salaries equal, that's like $50 million a year in talent that this room will represent when it's filled, once everybody gets through. The piece that I would tell you is, why do you do these things? If you look what happened at Cruise Automation, anybody familiar with Cruise Automation? Right, they were a company that was bought by GM. They were doing self-driving cars. They were bought about two years ago for $587 million. Last year, last year, uh, SoftBank and Honda put in another $2 billion into that company, which was held off. Right now, cruise automation is valued at $14 billion. When, when those investments by Honda and SoftBank went in to cruise automation, GM stock went up two points. I mean, this is not just impacting the software today is no longer doing a linear improvement of, of people's process. It, we're getting into an exponential space and one of the leading places that I have seen that people are investing is in Kubeflow, right? So what I wanted to do today was then bring this all together and say, look, the heartbeat of, of Kubeflow to me have been these core contributors. And one of them is right here on, on the stage. So I would like you all to welcome Jeremy Louie from, from Google who, you know, nights, weekends, holidays, he's there to answer questions. And, you know, I would just like to get a round of applause for, for Jeremy for everything that he's done <laughs> over the last year. Jeremy, hey. thanks so much. Thank you. And before I hand it off, all the speakers, what I'm asking them is, why do you do this? Why do you spend your extra time because um, I, I think there's a lot of really interesting applications uh, going on uh, outside in the world. So uh, we'll talk about one of them, which is this natural language code search that one of our collaborators is working on. Uh, Ted, do you want to answer the same question? Uh, why, why do you work on this? Why, why are you? Uh, I think that I don't I work on Kubeflow because I think it's a great example of a really complex um, technical challenge that uh, open source is well positioned to solve. So. All right. All right. So with, with that, uh, let's get started. So by way of introduction, my name is Jeremy Levy, as uh, Josh said, um, a very warm introduction. Uh, and so uh, I'm the tech lead at Google for uh, Kubeflow. Uh, Taya, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Taya Lampkin, and I'm the open source strategist lead um, on Kubeflow. Um, so thank you all very much for coming today to, to hear uh, about Kubeflow, and thank you, Josh, for uh, putting this together. Oh, do you want to just log in again? Sorry. Um, so we'll be talking today about Kubeflow and uh, kicking this things off, and we're going to be talking about building the next platform, ML platform together. Uh, and so 
um, here's the agenda for today. We're going to start off by talking about, you know, uh, why we built uh, Kubeflow. So, you know, we're going to start talking about the problem that we're seeing in industry, which is that uh, uh, putting ML into production, into products, takes way too long, and we're trying to use uh, Kubeflow and Kubernetes to solve this problem. And then we're going to describe in a little bit more detail, you know, what we mean by Kubeflow as a platform, and in particular, why we describe Kubeflow as a composable, portable, and scalable platform uh, on Kubernetes. And then finally, Tay will talk. T T Tay is going to talk about the community, you know, what we're doing and how our, what our community looks like. And then finally, uh, we'll kick it off, uh, close things out with a, a brief demo of what we have coming up in our next release, which will be 0 0.5 at the end of this month. And so, uh, what we hope you take away from today's talk and this day as a whole is that, you know, with Kubeflow, we're trying to make it easy to build machine learning products using Kubernetes. Um, so let's start off by talking about why Kubeflow. So here's an example of a product that um, one of our collaborators, Hamill, who's a data scientist at GitHub, is trying, is trying to build, right? So what you're seeing is you're seeing a search engine for code. So he typed into the, the search engine the query, ping REST API server, and return results. And then we're seeing that him return some results, which are samples of code that are pulled from GitHub. And so the key thing here is that if you actually looked at those uh, examples that he's returning, none of the words that appear in the search query uh, appear in the code. So it's not like he's doing keyword searching and matching against, you know, the name of the, f the function or the comments in the code. And the reason he's doing that is because he's actually used machine learning to learn what that code is doing and then learn how to map that to natural language so that he can search um, using uh, natural language, right? And so this has a lot of, you know, amazing use cases for something like GitHub and outside GitHub, because now you can really use GitHub to, uh, or to search code, to find code examples that do what you need, and it has other applications like, you know, uh, people who don't speak, who aren't, let's say, English speakers, can search for language, uh, for code using their natural, uh, their native language, and find code that was perhaps written by somebody uh, who doesn't speak their language. Um, so this slide sort of captures the journey he went through, and it captures the sort of challenge we see throughout the industry. So he started off by building a prototype and exploring his idea in a notebook, right? And so a notebook, in case folks aren't familiar, is an interactive environment where, where data scientists use to sort of rapidly prototype and test ideas, right? Um, and so with that, he spent about two weeks trying to, you know, uh, build a model using some data from GitHub and then sort of run some predictions inside the notebook to sort of do a, a, a reality and sanity check to see whether the results he was getting were useful and valuable. So after about two weeks, he saw that that was successful, that he saw that there was merits and that there's, uh, to this idea and that he could actually build a machine learning model to solve this problem. So then he spent about three days sort of, uh, you know, turning this into a pretty sort of web application, putting it behind like a, a pretty web server that you can sort of see here, you know, b bundling it up into like a Flask app. And he did that so he could, you know, create a, a prototype that he could shop around GitHub and get people really excited um, and, and get them to sort of invest in it. But then the, f the next step was actually sort of launching this publicly as an experiment on experiments.github.com. And that took three months, right? So most of his time and energy as a data scientist was not spent developing the model or trying to make the model better. It was actually getting the model into production and getting it launched, right? Um, and this is what we see throughout the industry. And the reason we see this is because in reality, when you're building uh, an ML product, what you end up with is a complex distributed system, and you end up with all of the DevOps challenges associated with managing and uh, large complex systems, right? So this is a, a slide or diagram that's taken from a picture, from a paper published by Google um, that was intended to describe why we spend so much time investing in machine learning related infrastructure, right? And so the key takeaway take is that your machine learning code, right? So the algorithm, um, in terms of the energy and sort of effort spent, it actually ends up being only a small part of your investment. Um, most of your time and energy ends up going into the supporting infrastructure around it that actually turns this into a product. So managing your resources, like your, your, uh, your VMs or your CPUs, um, doing logging and monitoring, security, all of that stuff. Um, and so this is really the genesis of Kubeflow. We said, you know, Kubernetes is really great at DevOps. It's really great at building complex distributed systems. Can we take advantage of, de of Kubernetes and really make a, create a platform for machine learning? So let's describe uh, Kubeflow as a platform in a little bit more detail. 
So this is what the machine learning development workflow looks like, right? So as a data scientist or uh, you know, trying to sort of build a product, these are the kinds of steps you go through, right? So you start off by doing um, you know, data analysis and data transformation. You know, where do I get my data from? How do I transform that data into data that I can inject into my model? How do I clean and validate that data? Um, then you go into the next step where you actually have to uh, build a model, you know, train it using your framework, whether that's TensorFlow or um, Scikit-Learn. Um, and then once you have the model, you actually have to roll that out into production. And once you have a model you know, running in production and serving traffic, you have all of the DevOps challenges associated with you know, keeping that up and running and healthy. Um, and so for each of these steps, we have you know, different frameworks or in, in different applications and tools and libraries that you might want to be using. Um, some of those are going to be developed by the Kubeflow community, and that's where we sort of you know, indicated by the stars. Those are the steps where uh, Kubeflow has seen some gaps, and we've decided to try to fill those gaps by building some some applications and libraries, but there's also you know, a, a large ecosystem already of tooling and, and, um, that exists out, out in the community, and we want to make it super easy for people to use that in a cohesive platform. So this is what the, uh, you know, this slide is sort of uh, aimed at giving you a sense of what the ML landscape sort of looks like, and it's um, a diagram that's being produced by the Deep Learning Foundation um, at uh, uh, the Deep Learning Foundation under the CNCF. Um, and so what they've done is they've sort of divided the world up into these different areas. So you have like traditional machine learning, um, you have deep learning, um, then you have your models, you have natural language processing, um, you have notebooks. Um, that second deep learning is actually supposed to be data management, I apologize. Um, and then each of these boxes, you can blow them up and you have a lot of different uh, libraries and applications that you can use. So if we look at you know, traditional machine learning, we have libraries like Spark MLlib that you can use. You can use libraries like Scikit-Learn. Um, you can use XGBoost. Um, within deep learning, you can use, um, you know, TensorFlow or PyTorch or a whole bunch of other frameworks. And even then, um, once you've picked your framework, you have a bunch of high-level libraries like Keras um, and Gluon that you can use to really build your models, right? So the, the challenge we see is that as a data scientist and um, uh, ML engineer, you have this incredible landscape um, that that's, that's very rich and full of tools, but actually cobbling these together um, into a cohesive platform is a really challenging and time-consuming problem, which is not where you want to be spending your time. And so with Kubeflow, um, we're trying to sort of organize the world and create a cohesive platform that's really easy for data scientists and ML engineers to consume. So this is how we sort of uh, you know, diagram our architecture. Um, and so this is one way to sort of view Kubeflow and get a sense of what it looks like. So at the lowest level, you can think of, um, we have a bunch of APIs and, and, and services that are very low level in the sense that they do one thing and they try to do that one thing very well. And some of these services um, are gonna be developed within Kubeflow by the Kubeflow community, but a lot of these are gonna be outside the Kubeflow community that we're just gonna sort of incorporate and integrate with. So as an example, we've created um, some Kubernetes custom resources um, to make it super easy to take advantage of Kubernetes to run uh, deep learning frameworks in a distributed fashion so you can scale out to train really large models on really large data sets by using multiple machines. Um, but we're also leveraging um, uh, services and applications in the, in the broader landscape like Argo, which is an orchestration framework um, to do like directed acyclic graph type workflows. Um, and we've been starting to work with you know, Spark. Uh, there's a Spark resource for running Spark jobs on Kubernetes. Um, and then in a, in a, if we go above this, we have some uh, systems, as we'll call them, that combine some of these lower level services into more complete functionality, right? So as one, as one example, um, we have a, a pipeline system which combines um, a bunch of different low level services to give users uh, a full experience in terms of um, describing and running and managing complex ML workflows, right? So we use some of these low-level resources like Argo to run uh, workflows, but then we provide a UI on top of that that makes it easy to visualize your runs and the results, you know, like the ROC curves for your models, um, as well as run those on a regular schedule. So that you can actually combine these services into complex workflows like I showed you before, where you don't just do, you know, train a model, you pre-process your data, then you train your model, and then you roll it out into production. Um, and then at the layer above this, 
We have a bunch of tools and libraries. So we have some command line tools like Arena, and some we have some libraries like Faring that are really sort of focused on end users and really trying to create a, uh, you know, that usability layer that sort of hides some of the low-level details of um, you know, Kubernetes and some of the other infrastructure so that um, we have a really uh, data scientist-friendly and usable platform. And then we have sort of what I would call these you know, vertical areas, you know, orchestration being one, where um, we try to tie all these layers together so that um, you know, we provide a cohesive platform. So orchestration is one because we want to provide a, you know, data scientists want to you know, do these complex ML workflows so they have to tie together multiple services. Um, and then metadata is the other one because I know from, from all these complex, uh, in, at every stage of these workflows, we want to keep track of what's happening so that we can understand what data we processed and how that was uh, used to produce our models. Um, and so here's, here's sort of the, the takeaway. Um, we want to produce a platform where the goal is users can consume their favorite ML applications and libraries. Um, and we want to make that, uh, so that's what we mean by composable, is they can use whatever library or framework they want to use. We want to be scalable, so we want to enable them to you know, run either lots of jobs or uh, take advantage of multiple machines, so scale out horizontally, but also vertically by using larger machines or using GPUs. And we want to be portable, so we want to be able to run you know, in the cloud or on an on-prem data center um, or even on their laptop. And for that, we're taking advantage of Kubernetes to provide a platform that runs anywhere. Um, and so our hope really, and one of the reasons that we're sort of trying to grow the community is we really think that um, as more apps sort of integrate with Kubeflow, um, that's going to attract more users to use Kubeflow because they can find what they're looking for on Kubeflow. And that in turn is going to convince more people to make their apps play well and integrate well with Kubeflow. So we're really trying to drive that, that virtuous cycle. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Taya to talk about our community. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about some of the core principles that we've um, established in the Kubeflow community that help us organize not only how we structure ourselves socially, but also how we uh, pursue some of our technical challenges. Um, so the first, so the first of these three core principles is for us the most important. It's that we um, are an open and inclusive community. Um, one of the things that Jeremy has touched on is that building an ML platform is a giant challenge and we can't do that alone. Um, we think that the Kubernetes community is a great model for how to successfully engage a large community um, to tackle like a huge technical hurdle. Um, and we really want to architect our community in a way that empowers individual contributors to take ownership of the compatibility points that um, track with their expertise. Um, what this means is that we uh, consider all members of the community to be equal and have an equal opportunity to contribute their ideas um, and expertise. Um, all, of th all ideas and perspectives are welcome. So what that means is that whenever we put a POC or a proposal out there, we really deeply want feedback. Um, it's really important to us that we hear from a wide variety of both users and contributors to make sure that Kubeflow um, succeeds as a product. And we're also doing something internally right now um, within the community to define clear paths to community leadership. We think that it's really important to have a diverse set of very invested leaders from a variety of companies that are invested in Kubeflow to make sure it succeeds. Um, and then inclusivity. Uh, we're committed to fostering a positive and harassment-free community. Um, we support that by having a code of conduct, which we expect all of our community members to abide by, whether it be on GitHub or at events like these. Um, we also have a really interesting inclusivity um, philosophy that we've uh, put together in a document on our community repo um, that was authored by a collection of people, but championed by Michelle Kasdan, who's one of our key evangelists at Google. Um, basically, it's an agreed upon set of rules that we as a community um, kind of abide by in terms of how we want to collaborate together. So it's more like what to do and less what not to do. Um, we're actually hoping to roll that out as something that other communities can borrow from as well. Um, and so just in closing for this slide, um, I think it's really important uh, to have a diverse community of builders serving a very, very diverse community of users. We don't have just like one user profile. We have data engineers, software engineers, data scientists, 
We're trying to serve all those people, and that means that the people building this product can't be just one kind of person. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Jeremy to cover two other principles that help us organize how we think about Kukla as a technical project. Yeah, so we have um, two, two principles that are a little bit more technical in nature. Um, or The first, I guess, is a little bit more product in nature. The first is we really want to focus on having a low bar and high ceiling. So low bar means we really want to make it super easy to get started with uh, Kuflow. So you know, minimize the number of Kubernetes concepts that um, people have to learn to get started. So if you go back to that original slide about what Hamill was doing as a data scientist, we want to make it super easy for somebody like Hamill, who's not a DevOps engineer, to get started you know, prototyping and developing his model you know, in a notebook on Kubeflow um, without sort of having to get distracted by learning Kubernetes. But then once he, he has to get that model into production, and he has to start thinking about some of the more complex you know, DevOps things, like scaling his model and security, we want that to be a smooth transition um, into doing those more complex tasks. We don't want him to fall off a cliff where now he's got to completely rewrite his model and re choose a different set of tools in order to take that model into production. Um, and then the final principle is that you know, we want to be Kubernetes native. And one of the things that this means is that uh, we're taking a hard dependency on Kubernetes, right? And one of the reasons we do that is as, as a community is that when we're you know, designing um, you know, how we're going to do things, whether you know, individual applications or things like our, how we're going to support notebooks, we want to be able to focus on uh, how we're going to do it on Kubernetes and not sort of have to think about and have discussions about um, you know, what to do and how to support non-Kubernetes native platforms. Um, and so this really helps us as a you know, uh, at a technical level in that regard. Um, and one of the reasons we can do this is because we think Kubernetes has been super successful and it's now supported and runs almost anywhere. So we don't see this as a, as we see this as a huge advantage. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Taya. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into our first principle, um, openness and inclusivity, and what that means in practice for our community. Um, so we believe that open source is a powerful model for collaboration for a, a project like this that has so many different components, um, so many different um, communities that we need to be compatible with. Um, and we really draw on the expertise um, of our community members to help provide that compatibility over a large surface area. We also want um, to provide a kind of test bed for machine learning innovation. Machine learning is still in the early stages as far as like the tooling that we need to support machine learning programs in production. And I think we, we really want to um, decentralize the innovation that happens in the project itself to make sure that people feel comfortable sharing the ideas um, and that the different components in the project serve as kind of test cases for how to incorporate um, different technologies and see kind of which ideas um, prove out to be the best ones based on their usage within the community's components in the GitHub organization. So um, that's worked out well so far. We have a really giant community. Um, well, I'm, giant is a relative term, <laughs> but I think it's growing very, very quickly. Um, so as far as like our 0.4 release, we had 137 individual PR creators, which represented a 47% increase over the last release. We had 1,053 PRs um, for a 0.4, which is also a 43% increase over the previous release. Um, we have 140 and counting community contributor contributors that come from 25 and more companies. And you can just take a look at um, the logos on the right-hand side to see all of the people that are investing in the project today. Um, and there are very many more that couldn't fit on this slide. Um, okay. So um, Jeremy mentioned how important it is to provide integrations with Kuflow to demonstrate its use um, in the machine learning um, market today. Um, we have some of uh, our best demo creators in the audience <laughs> right now. And uh, we have a pretty good path for how to um, share your ideas uh, as far as interesting integration projects and POCs in the community. So I just wanted to tell you um, how that works in practice. First, um, it's really great to connect with us in all the community channels we use. Um, that's Slack for asynchronous communication, GitHub, which is our kind of gravity and source of truth for all technical conversations in the community, and then our mailing list, which is more how we socialize ideas um, and make sure people are aware of what's going on in the project. So after you get traction around your idea in one of those channels, um, and come up with an interesting demo. You can provide it. Uh, you can demo it at our community meeting, 
We have um, once weekly community meetings that happen um, at alternating time zones to make sure that we serve all of our community members wherever they happen to be. Um, and then we also encourage people who have gone through the effort of creating a demo to contribute it to our Medium blog. Medium blog is a little bit, un, you know, <laughs> in, the progress, in the process of being a better um, place for ecosystem projects to kind of um, be shared and heard there. Um, but we really would like more contributors um, on the blog, so please let us know if you're interested in providing content. Um, okay, so a more kind of generic path to contribution for Kuflo. If you are interested in getting more involved in the project, maybe you have an idea for an issue that you want to solve or just um, want to somehow get um, involved. First, we think that it's really important to start by participating in community meetings, participating in or reading mailing list discussions. That's the best way to kind of ground yourself in the technical uh, milieu of the project. Um, and then, of course, read our contribu co uh, contributor guide. It's really important that you um, acquaint yourself with the processes that we use to get contributions through to make sure that your contribution doesn't fall through the cracks and that um, the investment that you put in it is uh, well received. Um, so a good place to start is a good first issue or help wanted issues that are tagged um, in the community, uh, in uh, the GitHub repos with that help wanted area tag. Um, then you'll open a GitHub issue, um, create a small proposal for more involved changes um, that you can use to build consensus with the community about your proposed design. Um, and then once you've gotten that uh, consensus, submit a PR and ask for feedback. Bring it to the maintainers, bring it to the community meetings until you get the feedback you need to um, get it into a release. Um, code is not the only thing that we need as far as contributions to the project. Other ways to help um, is evangelism and outreach. Um, one good example is attending and speaking at events just like these. Um, documentation is really important for usability. We have a very fast moving project that constantly changes. And we have a really high need for more people to um, collaborate with us on documentation. Issue triage is important as well. And um, we have about 444 issues open in the repo right now. It would be great to um, have more community members contributing to organizing those issues and setting priorities. Um, examples and tutorials that kind of define the happy path for our users um, who are testing out the product or serve as a reference for some of our more advanced users. Um, test and release infrastructure is a little bit of an unsung job, but is so important. And we're going to figure out how in the community we can make sure that test and release contributors are the most important people. <laughs> the, I think they're the most important people. Um, and then sharing your use cases, trying Kuflo and giving feedback. Um, this is an example of a use case that was contributed by a community member to our documentation um, website, but it's just actually one use case that is currently in the documentation or the use case folder on that website. We need more, um, and we're really, really looking forward to hearing how you're using Kuflo today and how other people um, can use it for similar use cases. Finally, you can organize an event like this. So I want to give a strong thank you for Josh Bottoms for putting all of this together. This came together at the last minute, and we need many more people bringing Kuflo to their local communities um, across the US and the world. OK, so I'm going to dive um, deep uh, really quickly into what it means to do community development at Kuflo um, before we look at that development and practice and take a look at our 0 0.5 demo for the upcoming release. So we release quarterly. Um, this release process is managed by a set of community members um, that have come together in a product management working group. Um, for each release and, and sometimes for you know multiple releases, we define a critical user journey, which is a key experience that we think it's important to develop to um, support our users in uh, being more successful at their jobs. Um, after we've agreed on a critical release journey to kind of organize our work, um, we take that to users, get their feedback, and then based on um, that feedback, we organize and prioritize our issues into release themes that then community members um, uh, step up to coordinate and throughout the lifetime life cycle of the release. We also report on the release um, progress weekly in our community meetings and also our product management meetings. 
Um, another really key theme um, that's kind of blossoming in our community right now is user-driven development. We just um, released our first ever Kubeflow user survey and, and um, got a really great response from the community. It was run and created entirely by the community. Um, a joint effort from Josh Bottom, um, Elvira from Cisco, me, and with some advice from our UXR researcher um, at Google. Um, we wanted to dig into who, why, where, and how people are using Kubeflow today. The, this, yeah, um, we have got 81 responses, which is actually a really, really big response for um, a small survey like this. Um, and we hope that this is a first step towards building a Kubeflow user advisory council that will eventually give us programmatic feedback on our CHAs and help us set our roadmap and release milestones. Um, just a couple interesting slides I wanted to share based on results from that survey um, is uh, an example of who, how we break down the users as far as what their primary roles are within their organization. Clearly, data and machine learning engineers are the biggest users of Kubeflow right now. We hope to eventually expand the number of data scientists using Kubeflow as well. Um, mostly enterprise uh, users are, are investigating Kubeflow, which was um, a little bit affirming for us. We think that Kubeflow is most useful in the enterprise setting, so that was good to see. Um, and then finally, this is a look at what people are um, looking to improve with their use of Kubeflow as far as their existing machine learning um, processes and programs. Um, and so I think that this, is going, this kind of project is going to help us make sure that we're steering Kubeflow in the right direction. I think it's really important because um, many of the people working on Kubeflow are not necessarily the target user. And so having this program where we programmatically get user feedback is critical um, to driving our release milestones. Um, and to, uh, we're going to have a demo of our 0 0.5 release that Jeremy will show you guys. So this is a, a quick preview of our demo. Um, so let's just go ahead and play that. So the idea here is that we've deployed Kubeflow, and so we're just kind of just get started. We're just showing you um, through the dashboard in GCP all the different services that ended up getting deployed um, as part of your Kubeflow deployment. And we're just kind of trying to illustrate the overall, um, you know, breadth of the platform. But the key thing starts right now where you can see what I'm doing is I'm creating a namespace because what we want to, one of the things we're sort of focused on is enabling teams to sort of operate in an environment where everybody gets their own um, uh, isolated environment in which to run things. Um, and so after I've created the na namespace, you can see this is our central dashboard, which allows you to sort of navigate between all the different services. And from here we've gone, we've clicked on the Jupyter Hub page um, to actually uh, spawn a notebook. And you can see we have this form-based approach where you can easily uh, spawn different notebooks and you can specify the resources um, and the Docker image that you want to use um, as well as a name, right? So from here you can spawn multiple notebooks um, and then, uh, you know, you just click spawn and now we're going to wait a second for it to, you know, spin up. Um, and it takes a little bit of time uh, just because, you know, you have to pull down the Docker image and get that started. Um, and so, you know, while, while we're just waiting a second for that to start, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to have you, have, um, you know, one of our calls to action today is we'd love to have people, you know, try, out, try and share Kubeflow. So, you know, try out Kubeflow, um, you know, go to our, our web page and then, you know, get started with it and then share your experience with us on either uh, Slack, GitHub, or one of our, um, or the mailing list. Um, and then the final piece that's showing up in the, in the, uh, in the uh, demo is that you can see we're actually uh, spinning up a notebook. Um, uh, we're, we're cloning an example from our repository. And in this notebook, um, we're actually defining our model. Um, it will come up in a second. And then one of the things we've added to our notebook is we've added a library called fairing, which is going to be in our uh, 0.5 release. And this allows you from your notebook to automatically build, you know, turn your notebook into a Docker container and then spawn that up on Kubernetes uh, uh, either for running the training or for doing the deployment of the model. And so we're completely hiding Kubernetes from the data scientists in an effort to make it more accessible. Um, and so with that, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so what we'd ask of you um, as you uh, depart from scale uh, later today um, is to try Kubeflow, give us feedback. Um, if you just really run into some major blocker, we'd love to hear about that. Um, and then finally, 
we are looking for local meetup organizers or event organizers or um, speakers who are interested in starting up a community here in LA. If that's something you're interested in, please come and talk to me um, at lunch or just email me at tedlampkin at google.com and I'd love to work with you. Thanks. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. Oh. I mean, in your slide, then you mentioned the MPICR. Is that message passing interface? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, <coughs> so, a uh, big fan of this project. Um, is there any um, future roadmap to incorporate more classical uh, machine learning frameworks like scikit-learn? Yeah, uh, right so now it seems very deep learning centric. Um, yeah, so we're we're making a big push to better support, uh, you know, uh, you know, Python frameworks. They're already supported uh, in Google. We just haven't done a really great job promoting that. Um, but like with Faring and some of these other efforts, you know, one of the things we're promoting is our XGBoost support um, and some you know, more traditional um, machine learning support. Any other questions? Ah, great, thank you. Is uh, GPU resource management addressed by Kubeflow at all? Is that kind of just offloaded to Azure on Kubernetes setup? Yeah, mostly we uh, we rely on um, Kubernetes to um, handle resource management, including GPUs, and mostly we just provide you know sugar on top of that. So as an example, like in our Jupyter Notebook spawner, we've made it super easy to attach GPUs to your notebooks. But you know under the hood, it's using Kubernetes. We're just kind of surfacing it in a data scientist friendly way. Any other questions? Awesome, thank you. Um, I'll give it back to Josh, I think. Where'd you go? Oh. So um, why Timo is getting set up, uh, just by show of hands, it was interesting in the survey, we saw more sh machine learning platform engineers using Kubeflow than data scientists, which was kind of reversed from what we thought. Just show of hands, are, any machine learning platform engineers in the room, Kubernetes-based folks? Yeah, okay, great. What about data scientists? Great, so we have some of both. Good. So, uh, Timo, uh, you uh, getting ready here? I'm surprised we don't have more questions. Now, come on, there's gotta be a couple stumpers for Jeremy. He's, uh, you know, done such a good job on this. Uh, is this kind of what you guys were expecting to see from, from the platform? Was that a good introduction? I mean, come on. Well, so give me an idea. Why did you show up? I'm going to ask you. Uh, <laughs> it just seemed like an interesting uh, track to be on for day one. Uh, I wanted to learn more about Kubernetes, and I'm interested in getting more into ML as well. So I'm a bit of a novice, you could say. but. Uh, yeah, seemed like a good place to meet like-minded people too. And that's really it. I mean, if you can make a chance to meet four or five people, I think what we saw in Dallas when we did this is that people started working in little teams together and helping them solve problems. And it was a nice kind of uh, flow on, on how things uh, kind of grew. And in fact, talking about da Dallas, uh, Timo, how are we doing? He can do machine learning, but can't plug his laptop in. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, is that you? I'm just kidding. All right. Do you, you want to use the... Uh,
Thank you. I think we'll go ahead and actually get, get started. My colleague is uh, just grabbing some water back here, but uh, I'm Timo Meckler and this is Charles Adetoloy who's just walking up to the stage. We're both from Maven Code and we're gonna talk to you guys today about orchestrating and deploying machine learning platforms at scale with Kubeflow. But before we really get into the meat of our presentation, uh, we're gonna talk just a few minutes about um, a company and ourselves. So Charles and I both work for Maven Code. We're a Dallas Fort Worth based software and consulting company. Uh, we started in about 2008 and have worked with a variety of clients, uh, both large and small companies uh, in, in the data space since that point. Uh, today, our primary, our primary um, areas of expertise are in providing our clients uh, both uh, de deploy deployment and uh, the deploying of scalable AI and ML pipelines and building out uh, that uh, related infrastructure. Uh, we also work with our clients to do the actual modeling once we've uh, deployed the data pipelines. We more broadly offer cloud services to our clients, so we still work with clients today to help bring legacy applications into the, into the cloud. We build applications, microservices. We provide consulting around Kubernetes, uh, deploying that, managing that, and more recently, actually, with, with Kubeflow, and I guess that's why we're here today. Uh, we also have uh, data security uh, practice in our company. We're a data company, and we take data security very seriously. So this is one thing that we offer. Uh, and then finally, we also offer training uh, to both small teams and enterprises on these topics, whoever might be interested. About ourselves, so uh, again, my name is Timo, and I'm an architect and product manager at Maven Code. I've been with the company about one and a half years. Prior to joining Maven Code, I spent a good seven to eight years working in energy commodities trading, both as an analyst and a strategist, uh, working on, on, on trading desks, building out scalable uh, research platforms and developing trade strategies, working a lot with, with traders. Uh, and then Charles, uh, next to me here, has got well over a decade of experience working with many different companies and building scale, uh, large scale distributed data software platforms, and, and again, across a variety of different verticals. So he's got a lot of experience there. But uh, that's enough about us. Let's, uh, we always like to start kind of with a motivating uh, question. And that is, you know, we're all here because we have some interest in AI and ML, but really why is the time right right now to do machine learning? And for us, it really has come down to three main things. You know, number one, you know, it's just the availab availability of data and the amount of data that's being generated. Everything these days seems to generate data we're able to, and we're able to store that data. In fact, I think we'd all be surprised just how much data is being generated just in this room on our devices uh, right now. But it's not just data itself. It's, it's also the availability to, the ability to process that data, having these computing resources and, you know, having uh, services on, uh, on managed cloud providers such as Google, Microsoft, AWS, you know, the ability to be able to spin up, say, a thousand virtual machines in, uh, in just a few clicks of a button to be able to really process large scale, large scale data. And the third thing that's been really important is just the, is the ability to model, you know, model. All these modeling frameworks that have come about in the last few years and continue to, to grow and mature. So it's really the combination you know, of these three things, you know, that's just, you know, in our opinion, that's really gotten us to, you know, why the time is right right now to do machine learning and to do machine learning at, sc at scale. So if we got everything there, then okay, things should be pretty straightforward, right? We can, anybody can just get started on machine learning. So we found through our practice that there's still a lot of perception that machine learning is kind of simple like this. You, you start with some data, maybe it's pretty pictures of puppies, maybe it's a time series, then you sit down for a while, you know, and hack away at your laptop or desktop and just write a lot of really cool machine learning code and out comes the results, the predictive power um, of the model. Well, while you can do things that way, the reality of the matter is that things aren't really quite that simple. And just like the presentation before us, we also saw that, you know, writing the actual code is just a really small component of a machine learning pipeline. There's a ton of data collection that needs to go on to really be able to get a good, good model performance and be able to do machine learning at scale. You know, you have data, but is it good data? Is it verified data? You, know, you ha might have to label it, you might have to transform it, and you have to store it, and then you have to set up all the infrastructure for that data ingestion to do that. If once you actually have your data and you start modeling, it becomes about 
is we're like actually describing the data properly. We'll have the right features. We'll have to do feature engineering. And once you know, once you've done all this, there's more yet. Let's say you have a model you like, and okay, now I'm ready to put this thing into production. Well, you're not done yet. There's serving infrastructure to worry about. Once you get into production, you have to monitor it. Is the model performing well? Is there bias being developed? Do I have to retrain? You know, and then there's the management of all these resources, all these all these machines, etc., that you have to worry about. And finally, you know, analysis tools. So really, a, a, an actual machine learning pipeline, it, you know, is far more complex than just sitting down one afternoon and writing code. And we at Maven Code, you know, through our consulting engagements over the last decade, but particularly over the last few, have also realized this. And so what we've done actually internally is build our own software platform to make this simpler. And that software platform is called Smart Deploy AI. And I'm just going to give a quick plug to this before we get back to Kubeflow. But essentially what Smart Deploy AI does is take away uh, this side of the diagram and help automate it. So we've built a platform that helps anyone really quickly uh, uh, you know, bring up scalable AI and ML uh, data pipelines on in the cloud or on premise. So really we have an automated platform that allows you to do that. And this is, this is great if you're in a situation where, again, you may not have the DevOps expertise, but you really want to do AI and ML at scale. With Smart Deploy, we can cut the time down to get, get you running up at scale and the cost down. So we think this is going to be a, just a wonderful tool as AI and ML get more democratized and small organizations and mid-sized organizations are looking to really get ramped up on this. Instead of hiring, spending a lot of money and hiring a lot of DevOps engineers and multiple data scientists and developers, with Smart Deploy AI, a couple data scientists can up, get up to speed very quickly. So, you know, to drive that home, our Smart Deploy AI platform really makes it seamless to set up scalable end-to-end -end AI and ML platforms in, in the cloud or on-premise. We are already using this internally with our client engagements, and we're looking for a broader release to the public later this spring. And one quick last plug about the uh, platform and its features. Well, we do integrate it with Kubeflow, and one nice thing that we also offer is intelligent monitoring of that whole data pipeline. And we offer you know, people that are involved in the whole AI and ML process in the organization to be able to collaborate. So there's a collaboration workflow. We offer metrics so that anyone from the data scientist all the way up to the C-suite can, can see what's going on. Are we seeing the right return on this project? How much are we spending? Should we continue to pursue this, et cetera? So it's, it's, that is really a big part of the platform we're very, very excited about. And uh, we actually got uh, uh, certified or got uh, accepted into the Google Cloud SaaS initiative just this past month. So very, very excited ab about that. But enough about our product. Let's go back and talk real briefly about you know, what does a typical machine learning production deployment lifecycle look like for us at Maven Code. So you know, we've worked with a variety, variety of different clients, a variety of different industries, you know, energy, oil, gas, telecom, retail. It always starts out with having some you know, domain knowledge. You need to understand the industry that you're in. If you're trying to model something you don't understand, it might not turn, turn out so well. So we start with that, and it's all about the data, have, making sure you have the right data. Do you still have to acquire data? Do you have to you know, label, transform, store that data to make sure that it's actually ready for modeling? And once you've got your data, you know, then we work with the client and say, okay, what's the right kind of model to use? You know, what should we be doing to model this? And then you start modeling. Once you've got a model, you start training. You start thinking, am I getting the right performance? You start testing, validating. You might go back and say, oh, I don't have enough data. I need to start over, collect more data, then try this again. You tune the model some more. And then after a while of this iterative process, then you say, okay, I've got something that I'm ready to put into, into production. You know? and, what, and once you're at, at that point, you know, we, we've always encouraged our clients to deploy on Kubernetes because we've worked a lot with you know, deploying cloud-native applications on the cloud, and so Kubernetes provides this, this common layer for deployment. So the whole point really about this is when you have this uh, production life cycle, you want to be able to repeat that over and over and over again without having to spend a lot of time and a lot of money to redo it. This should, this, you know, for example, if, you, um, if you're a company and let's say you have multiple power plants and you're trying to model each plant separately, you should be able to use the same life cycle, the same process for each one without having to spend six or nine months to get it going. So we're really looking for having a common deployment platform. And it's also important for organizations, if you're the, if you're the data scientist in the organization, as Zoe learned in the last presentation, you do not want to focus on all the deployment details. You want to focus on the modeling, the domain knowledge, you know, describing the data properly, collecting the, the data. But by being able for us to deploy things on Kubernetes, we are able to do 
things like you know model serving, you know scoring, performance elevation, uh, evaluation, sorry, monitoring, versioning, and so forth. So really, we want to use Kubernetes. You know that's become so popular for you know deploying cloud native application to build a cloud native machine learning stack. That's what we're trying to do. And so the idea is that it doesn't matter what infrastructure you're on, whether you're on Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, you know, or you're maybe on-premise, Kubernetes provides that common layer. And then by putting Kubeflow on top, you know, we're able to do, we're able to do machine learning deployment easily. And the data scientists can interface through that, through that infrastructure, through, through a Jupyter notebook, and really just has to worry about you know, what modeling framework and process do I want to follow? Do I want to do training in Serving TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, or even something else. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague who's going to talk a little bit more in detail about Kubeflow pipelines and how we deploy them. Thank you, Sumit. Yeah, so uh, one of the things we do and uh, the project we work on is to like help our clients through the life cycle of uh, getting data all the way to where we can model it and uh, do some analysis with them. So a typical use case could be like this. Uh, we have clients generating data from sensors on maybe windmill farms, uh, or maybe like um, from the oil rig uh, from Texas, or maybe an healthcare IoT device. So um, we do all our, set, uh, we do in this case, we're running in the cloud, so we run all our analytics on, on Google Cloud. So our typical framework looks like this. So what, one of the things we've done is to leverage on the Kubeflow pipeline which is one of the great projects um, under the Kubeflow, uh, the Kubeflow community is working on. Uh, we want to be able to compose this infrastructure uh, and basically be able to deploy it and make it very repeatable. So in this case, um, we're trying to deploy a model and train a model and push it, push it out to like edge device. Um, a lot of all these devices can run on TensorFlow model, the TensorFlow lights. So what we do is like uh, we ingest the streaming data coming into a PubSub queue. It could be Kafka, it could be anything else. Uh, we use data flow, or uh, if you're running on, um, I mean, you can use data proc as well, or use uh, run a Spark um, ETL process to do that. Then we write it out to a storage location. So we want to be able to compose all these steps uh, with Kubeflow. And one of the things over the over the years that we've evolved to, uh, one of the things we're doing right now is to run our pipelines with Kubeflow pipeline. We can compose all these tasks, tasks into small subsets of tasks. And um, you can, we have a task tree for it in the pop up queue, and another, another task tree for bootstrapping the ETL with data flow, then another task tree to write it to like a, a, a story location where we can use it to train our model. So um, what's the Kubeflow pipeline like? So the Kubeflow pipeline basically allows you to bootstrap your infrastructure and run your runtime code. So um, everything is all Docker container. So you start up that Docker container, it kicks off, um, your, it boots up, it bootstraps your infrastructure. So let's say you're connecting to a queue, it's gonna it's gonna launch the connection. You need to connect to that queue, then it will execute your runtime code. So um, a, a typical setup will look like this. Uh, we have our runtime. I mean, the the components is translation code that bootstrap the infrastructure. Then inside that, the Docker container files the runtime code that connects to like a queue and read up all the things that we have in there. So um, this, is a, this is a snapshot for our project setup. So the Docker file basically wraps up everything and you deploy and that's a Unicode work and that's one of the tasks we execute. So the whole idea is for us to concatenate all these tasks and create a dash, which is what becomes the Kubeflow pipeline. So looking back at the pipeline we have on the previous slide, um, it's gonna look like this. Uh, we have the first step will be to like uh, connect to the queue or uh, read up whatever message we have on the queue. Uh, we do like an ETL process, probably to clean up the data set. Who's that? Hello? Oh yeah, sorry about that. So the first step would be for us to connect to the queue, uh, read up the message from the queue. Then the next step would be for us to like uh, do like an ETL process. Maybe you want to clean up the data, reorganize the data, and things like that. Then the next step will be for us to roll it up and write it to a location where we can feed up the data sets uh, for our machine learning training. So um, up the over, overall, the pipeline looks like this. Uh, we bootstrap our pipeline. Um, the pipeline contains all these stage, the data flow ETL stage, the roll-up stage, the training of the model stage, 
and there's a Kubeflow pipeline that has an annotation for you to like compose all these steps. And this annotation helps you to compile and generate an executable um, generative compressed file, which is an Argo ML. It's a big contribution for, from the Argo ML team. And we can now deploy this and use it to run our models. So um, once we do that, uh, they generate a zip file that contains the pipeline information and all the metadata about the pipeline. Uh, we upload it to our Kubeflow uh, pipeline. So from there, you can see the DAG, all the stages. So you can, I mean, one of the cool things about this is like you can debug each step of the pipeline. So let's say I'm ingesting data and something is not coming on properly. I can go in and debug that stage. Maybe I need to upgrade my ETL process. I need to like concatenate my ETL process with some other process as well. I can do that. So this is a simple like four stage process as part of our pipeline that we go through. Uh, we can run multiple of these in parallel, but once you upload uh, the pipeline information, you get this nice uh, diagram that illustrates your DAG and everything going on in your pipeline. So um, the cool thing about this is like uh, like uh, Jeremy and Timo uh, alluded to earlier, is like whenever you're building a machine learning pipeline, you want to be able to manage the process and not get uh, like entangled with all these other things. One of the things, the advantage of building a pipeline this way in the past few months is like, we want to try out different things. A customer comes in as like, hey, we have this new data source, we have this new event attribute coming as part of the event source. We want to be able to like append it to what we're doing. So in the past, doing this was really a pain. So, but now we can create a different version um, of the container code running as one of the task unit, and we can quickly test it out. So if everything works out good, then we can flip up that version, which is all these things that are just Docker image that you concatenate along your pipeline. So I can decide to like create a new version, test it out real quick for my uh, maybe reading of the events. If everything is okay, then I can just promote it and decommission the old um, part of the pipeline. And this applies to any other part of the pipeline. I may just decide to like um, do some more test. I mean, my tra training of my model, I might want to do some more training, create a new version of the pipeline that I mean, of the task on that stage that does the training and deploy it as a Docker container. And once everything works out good, then I can flip it over. So um, the other thing, the advantages of doing this as well is like I can run multiple experiments. So normally whenever you're doing machine learning, you want to like um, test things out. Um, you want to change your hyperparameters and see how things behave. So with this, we can run multiple experiments concurrently by changing all the hyperparameters, running it through the pipeline and seeing now, I mean, checking out everything behave. So with that, I can have different versions of my model, do quick A-B testing to see how things are going. So um, to that, uh, the advantages of Kubeflow pipeline for us is mainly allowing us to like scale and um, doing distributed training. It's a lot more easier than before when we first got started where we have to bootstrap all these things by I mean, writing shell scripts to do all our DevOps and teach things together. Uh, we can do faster, it, the iteration is a lot more faster right now. So we can easily like um, train multiple models at once, see the results and see how everything is behaving. Um, and uh, uh, overall, our productivity has increased as a result of this. Then um, serving the model, the other part I didn't show in this diagram is the serving part. So with this, we can serve our model and see how the model is behaving I mean, in production and see we can do quick A-B testing to see which model is better. And based on that, we can decide to adopt a model or promote or decommission a particular model. And um, the other cool thing is like, because all these things are dockerized and their containers and each stage is part of the pipeline. There's a lot of all, the, all these Docker containers out there that we leverage on. A lot of them are pre-installed with things like a TFMA, TensorFlow Model Analysis, where you can do real-time analysis of what's going on on your model and see how the two models are behaving. Uh, TensorFlow Transformation Framework, which is part of Apache Beam. Uh, we use that a lot for all our data flow ETL process. So. Um, we, c we, we can leverage on all these pre-built models, uh, Docker containers that contains all the things that we want to do. And um, we can control when we decide to like adopt a particular release or change because all these things are in a big flux. So one of the things we notice is like if you're, if you're using Apache Beam and there's a slight bump up in a version of it and you, you, we're not aware of that, 
um, it can derail a lot of things that we're doing. So we want to be able to like control our own internal environment whenever we're building all these things. So with this, uh, we have a lot more control in terms of how we deploy things and how we accept things from uh, the community into our own uh, internal development ecosystem. And overall, um, it makes things a lot more possible because Kubernetes is a common baseline for all these infrastructures. We're a consulting company, so we want to be able to like build things that we can repeat across for multiple customers. So if you're running on Amazon, on Google, or Azure, or on-prem, um, as long as we're running Kubernetes as a baseline, I think we can easily help you get things going um, on your team. And overall, for us, is the efficiency and from our team in terms of like getting things out and getting things going for everybody. So I'm going to hand it over back to Timo. Um, if you have any questions, um, we'll be able to answer you as well. Yeah, just a quick thank you to everybody. Uh, Google in particular for giving us a bunch of uh, credits to burn on Google Cloud to get all this up and working. Conference organizers here, and especially to Josh for put, you know, putting all the effort in, and the Kubeflow team uh, for working with us. And then finally, uh, just uh, yeah, uh, just a little bit about us now to get in contact with us. Again, we're a consulting company. If you're looking to get uh, spun up and build a data pipeline in the cloud, or you're interested in learning more about our smart deploy AI platform, come talk to us afterwards. Uh, we'd, we'd be happy to discuss that. So with that, I'll open up for any questions in the audience. Yes. After looking at some of the slides on Kubeflow and US, does it work like the Amazon AWS SageMaker? Um, the question was like, does this work like the Amazon AWS SageMaker? Uh, to some extent, yes. But the thing about SageMaker is like you're locked into Amazon. So, and um, if you're trying to be cloud native, if you don't want to be locked down to a particular vendor, because the GPU si prices varies, it's a lot more cheaper with Google to like run all these kind of workloads. And the other thing is like uh, you can run this as a managed service. So what I mean by that is like on Google, you have things like Dataflow that you don't have to worry about your ETL process, bootstrapping the server and everything like that, or BigQuery and all those kind of services. Um, with that, you're not logged in. You can decide to like move back to Amazon and do things on Amazon as well. But the whole idea is for you not to be logged into a particular um, infrastructure provider in this case. Do your customers tend to reuse the same infrastructure for the training portion and for the serving portion, or do they tend to have separate um, whether it's separate physical infrastructure or separate clusters for those two purposes? So uh, to that question, um, in most cases, yes, because they're running entirely on Kubernetes. So you can have a seven on a particular uh, pod running in your Kubernetes. And you can have it training the model on, on the infrastructure as well. And um, if, you're there, if you're using managed services on Google, you can use things like Cloud ML. Uh, in that case, it runs on a different infrastructure. And um, for like, if you're building like IoT devices, all these edge devices, you can actually push your model to that device after training them. Any more questions? Questions? Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having us.
Can you hear? Oh, you can hear me. Croquet. <laughs> so, yes, I think we are. So, hello. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Vangelis Kukis. I'm the CTO of Aricto. I'm here to talk to you about advanced data management with Cookflow. Okay. So, Josh asked the very first thing he did, right? Uh, what's our motivation in this? Why are we working with Cookflow? Well, exactly as Jeremy mentioned in the first presentation, where will machine learning run on? Machine learning will run on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is becoming the de facto standard for deploying applications across clouds, on-prem, in the cloud, the single declarative language of explaining what kind of workloads you want to run. Okay. And then you're interested in ML workflows, right? Okay. What do you need to run ML workflows? You need all these things. You don't just need the model, you need your data sets and your notebooks, that's what you, you work with. Okay, how many of you use notebooks? Lots, I guess. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you use notebooks? Lots of people use notebooks. Okay, and then you need to run training and maybe distributed training in parallel, and then you need pipelines, a single declarative way, reproducibly, to explain what you want to run in sequence, okay? And then you need to track your experiments and do hyperparameter tuning and serve and deploy in production and you need to monitor this. Okay, are you going to build this yourselves? You'll use Kubeflow for this. That's what Kubeflow does. Kubeflow containerizes all these things on Kubernetes exclusively so you can go on without doing the actual hard ML work instead of having to worry about how do I run my uh, models on Kubernetes. Okay, so having seen this and having seen people struggle with how to get the workflows and Kubeflow is a composable, reproducible way of doing this, what do you need next? So you need all of these components. This is a full ML workflow, okay? And Kubeflow's mission is to make super easy for everyone to develop this kind of workflow and deploy it anywhere and manage it across platforms, across locations. Okay, so if I have these components, I'm done, right? I'm good to go. Well, no, you're not. There's something missing. Kubeflow gives you a reproducible, composable way of declaring what you want to run. Are you okay? There's this tiny bit missing, which is you need your data to run. You need to track your data. You need to know what data you worked on to produce the results you produced. Oh, I have this great model, it works, it's got 99.99% accuracy. Okay, can my colleague reproduce my results when they train? No, why? Because I used this specific data set which no longer exists. Or because someone cleaned the data set, but the way they cleaned it, which was supposed to improve accuracy, well, it actually uh, you know, hurt accuracy. You must have seen this, right? How can I go back and have full lineage for my model? I need to have a, a reproducible way of explaining how this model came to be. I need to track my metadata and my data. So what do people do today? That's what we can talk about. And why are we in Kubeflow? To show an end-to-end -end data plus code way of working and make this uh, work for everybody, for everybody. So this is a figure from the TFX paper by Google. TFX is Google's internal ML platform, right? And all of these components have been open sourced now by Google. These are libraries to do specific steps in an ML pipeline. Okay, so Kubeflow, the paper assumes there's a shared configuration framework and job orchestration framework. In the case of Kubeflow, this orchestration framework is Kubernetes. Kubernetes will orchestrate your workflows as pods, right? And then Kubeflow covers this. It containerizes all of these and more components to give you a very easy declarative way of saying, I want to run a parallel job, okay? And then Kubeflow takes care of this. 
an integrated front end for essentially logging into the cluster and using it. And our contribution to Kubeflow is uh, we are major contributors to the notebooks and uh, UI uh, front ends for uh, Kubeflow. We start from the user. How can the user actually you know, log in and the, use the infrastructure? They start from notebooks, so we are contributing to this. So this is the one end of the uh, story. And then the other end is these two layers at the bottom, shared utilities for garbage collection, data access controls, and pipeline storage in general. What is this going to be for Kubeflow deployments? This is where our software comes in. So we give you software to manage your data as your pipeline runs. We are the mount point that you see. We are the file system you store stuff in. And you can then snapshot this file system and reproduce it and clone it and share it with your colleagues. So you can have a reproducible uh, full workflow. So why are we in Kubeflow? To uh, tell an end-to-end user-driven story. One end is how do people log into the platform and explain what they want to do. And the other end is what happens with, the, uh, with their data at the lowest level. Traditionally, we have been data management, storage people. But Kubeflow has been such a vibrant, user-driven community. So that's why we are part of this. So we'll talk about data in this presentation. And please feel free to think about how you use your data and uh, ask questions accordingly after the presentation. So our mission is planet scale data management. Manage your data across platforms, across locations, globally. We give you software to snapshot all of your file system, version it with a specific version, package it, distribute it in a peer-to-peer -peer way with your colleagues across locations, share it from a single pane of glass so you can have access control lists, who sees what. And you can do it across teams and locations, on-prem, on your own deployments, or on the cloud. So how does this fit into the Kubeflow pipeline story that Maven Code also very nicely explained in the previous presentation. You have a pipeline, it has three steps. How do people actually make the steps work today? What they usually do is they have all of their data in an external data lake and they write specific code to access the data lake. So I know my data is on S3, so I import S3 client, I import my tokens and I go to S3 in these specific buckets and find my data. That's what you do. Okay, what happens if this data changes? I don't know. What data did my pipeline run, uh, use when it ran? I don't know. Can I run my pipeline on Google Cloud and keep my data on S3? I can, but then performance suffers. Can I develop on-prem and then run my pipeline on the cloud? Where's my data? So the traditional approach is import S3 client, go to the lake, bring data locally, because that's the only way to actually have bearable performance. Uh, crunch it, then store it back to the data lake. Ra uh, lather, rinse, repeat for all steps. That was a right click, sorry. Okay. Is there any better way? Yes. So we are your data management layer. You mount us, you work on a disk that you see slash data, data one, data two. You can clone this disk from an existing snapshot so you can have ready-made versions of your data to start from. I want to start from this data set. I declare it, I access it via slash data, and I see one terabyte of data. This is a local disk on your local cluster, no matter where you are. And then when the step runs, what do you do with this data? Do you allow the next step to just go touch it? Well, you can, and that's what you do. You don't need to transfer the data, it's just there. But before you allow the next step to mess with the data, what do you do? You snapshot it. Why? So you can go back in time and see exactly what the step produced. So you have a declarative reproducible, immutable pipeline. Everything is immutable. You can go back in time and see exactly what happened. So the next step 
starts from a clone of whatever the previous step produced, and then the next step starts from a clone of whatever the previous step produced. This is our vision for advanced data management in Kubeflow. And then by having every Kubeflow component work with persistent volumes, you can use this across Kubeflow. So our mission is to make sure every single Kubeflow component uses Kubernetes persistent volumes in a vendor agnostic way. And then we know that our technology integrates as one more storage vendor in Kubernetes, and you can do all these things. This is the end-to-end -end story. Make sense? So why is this important? Because underneath, we use a local object store to store everything, but the users never see this. So we maintain uh, hashed chunks of your data on a local object store. If you're not working on Amazon, we use S3. If you're working on-prem, we can use a standard NFS shell. So then, because you have a way of running your pipeline, what if you want to run a pipeline in a hybrid way, both on-prem and on the cloud? Because every step gets its input as a snapshot of the previous step, running a pipeline in two locations becomes running a pipeline, a meta pipeline of two steps. One, step one, run a pipeline on-prem. Step two, run a pipeline in the cloud. How do I connect these two steps? I snapshot the output of step one and give it as input to step two. So by having this kind of flexible data management, you can solve the how do I run a hybrid pipeline problem. You just take the output of step one and feed it into step two. And then if a pipeline produced an exciting result, how do I reproduce it? I take the code of the pipeline, which I have committed in Git somewhere, and it's a Python declaration, as Maven code demoed previously. I feed it the exact same input somewhere else even, in another cloud, one cloud that may be faster, may have more GPUs, may be easier for me to use, and I expect the exact same results. So this is it. By being able to handle your data sets the same way you handle your code, essentially data commits, you can reproduce the pipeline in another location. We sit underneath your volumes and we synchronize all state. We synchronize data among locations in a peer-to-peer -peer way. So this may sound interesting, right? And you may want to try it out. Okay, so what are next steps? I'll come back to this. So how do we modify the model? There's usually three stages in building an ML workflow, but you know better and you can correct me. First step is how do I develop something, then how do I train, then how do I deploy? And people would like to develop locally on their laptops, that's where it's easiest for me to develop, but I need to train at scale, so I'll use a big cloud like Google's and use lots of GPU-enabled instances, and then I need to deploy in thousands of locations because I do autonomous cars and they need to run my models. Where's my data? I keep all of my data in a single data lake. And this suffers for the reasons I explained previously. What's our approach to this? Instead of having a gigantic reservoir of data, Pipelines in the same declarative way and use the same APIs and we do your data where you need it. This is the world of technical industry. 
of those principal orchestrating instructing Kubernetes to orchestrate your workloads across all locations. The workloads use the same declarative Kubernetes based language to do that. We make Kubeflow data aware. What does data aware mean? We, we contribute code to Kubeflow so it always uses persistent volumes. It's not, <coughs> excuse me, it's not a Ricto specific code. We contribute code to Kubeflow to always use persistent volumes. But then Kubernetes, persistent volumes is this PVC world over there. Okay, but then Kubernetes has a pluggable storage driver interface, they call the CSI, the container storage interface. We are an implementation of the container storage interface. We use the container storage interface to orchestrate your local storage wherever you are. And we bring this peer-to-peer -peer data synchronization map. So this is how it works. And now you may want to try it out. So what's next steps? Next steps is we're super happy to announce and you should see it on the Kubeflow blog, that we have a packaged version of Kubeflow. We call it Mini Kubeflow, which is not a very, I'd say, original name, because it was a script of nature, right? As a way to uh, run, spin up a, a simple Kubeflow deployment locally. So we've seen that one of the major hurdles in getting started with Kubeflow is how do I install it? So we have taken the latest Kubeflow release, 0 0.4, and we're now working to package the latest 0 0.5 uh, master, what's now being prepared. We have put it in a virtual machine image. You can download it, <coughs> it's two commands, and you can run it locally. So we have a workshop at five. Please be here if you want to know more about it, where we'll be demoing how this works end to end. So that's the overall idea. You have a very simple way of spinning up a local Kubeflow cluster in like minutes, if you meet the original uh, download part. This is it. If you want to ask any questions, I don't know, am, am I out of time? No, I'm not. Uh, okay, so the question was, do we synchronize data on demand when the data is requested or do we do it continuously, right? So. Uh, the difference in our approach compared to a traditional um, uh, active, passive, uh, primary, secondary uh, replication approach is that we don't replicate data. We do not store your data. We do not replicate in your data. What we do is we sit by your data, by your primary storage on the side. We snapshot it periodically by extracting what has changed in a differential way, so it's super efficient. And then we give you a way to essentially declare the data you're interested in. Someone publishes data sets, as in publishes a bucket, makes it accessible, and then other people subscribe to this bucket. So by having this kind of publish and subscribe um, semantics, you can declare the kind of data you're interested in, and this brings you in the swarm, it's an actual swarm, like a torrent swarm, of people interested in this data, so you then start to synchronize. And we do it in a way that's actually authenticated and uh, private. So it's not just public exchange of information. It's you have to prove to others that you have you, that you're allowed to be part of this swarm. And you take tokens and you we, we establish encrypted links. There's lots of technical stuff. But the overall idea is there's full access control lists of who shares what with whom. Can you repeat the question, sorry, I missed it. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, I get the question. Uh, no, we won't work with your data if it's just directly on the object store. We use the object store for our purposes. We maintain our format in the stored data. So we can then synchronize it this way. So essentially, there's got to be a first ingress step. You continue using your data lake any way you like. We don't touch it. But the very first step in your pipeline is ingressing into the pipeline, into us, 
the subset of data that this pipeline is going to work with. And then we give you a very efficient way of snapshotting it. And this is what we will be demoing on Minikube flow in the afternoon. How do you interact with the PVC and PV uh, API in Kubernetes? Is it you create a new uh, class or is it kind of hidden behind the scenes and reading from the Kubernetes API? So the question, oh, you heard the question. The question was how do we integrate with Kubeflow and how do we interact with, with Kubernetes? And how do we interact with Kubernetes is a creation of PVCs. So we are a CSI plugin. Kubernetes says, I want a new persistent volume of size 100 gigabytes. We annotate the volume and give it extra information from where to clone. So if you pass us an annotation that says, I want you to clone from this data set, when we create the PVC, we create the PVC, and we instruct your primary storage to create the PVC and then hydrate it with all these things, but Kubernetes doesn't know about this, then you just mount your PVC. So you don't see us directly, you see us as a CSI plugin. And we extend Kubeflow to pass this kind of annotations to lower layers. Does this answer your question? Ah, okay. So, yeah, yeah, I have the exact answer to this, and we can demo it later. Okay, the notebook UI, when you request a notebook, will request a PVC for you, and we will dynamically provision the PV underneath, and the PV will be bound to the PVC, and you as a data scientist doesn't have to know anything about this, and this is important because if we get data scientists worried about PVCs and PVs, we are not in a good place. I think that's the general idea, right? We don't want people worrying about PVCs and PVs and Kubernetes and pods. We want them to see a uniform notebook-centric interface in Kubeflow. Any other question? Uh, am I out of time? I think I am. Okay. Uh, thank you.